Sticking with the same region that Steve was just talking about. Great. Thank you, Crystal. Again, I'm here to talk about instrumenting a glacier serve watershed in the Nooksack River Basin. Uh, but more than just that, I'm here to tell a story about a small tribe, about 2,000 members on a 2.2 acre reservation, uh, taking the lead on behalf of a whole bunch of stakeholders addressing climate change, and also a story of collaboration. We're not just doing it in our own little um, corner black box. We're engaging a whole bunch of different uh, stakeholders and contributors to this overall project. Um, Co-authors on this presentation include Jezer Below, Bob Mitchell from Western Washington University, Christina Banaragoda, um, University of Washington, as well as Silvertip Solutions, Ryan Murphy, who's a graduate student under uh, Bob Mitchell. Collaborators include Maury Pelto, uh, Nichols College, Steve Klein, who you just heard from, Treva Co, my, my co-manager at the Nooksack Indian Tribe who gave a presentation yesterday, as well as Chris Franz, who's going to be given a presentation later during the session. Uh, the objectives of this presentation include describing the components of our climate change project, describe watershed instrumentation and data collection system, identify um, applied collaboration, and discuss how this information will be used, and present some of the preliminary results. Uh, sources of funding comes from the EPA, Bureau of Indian Affairs, Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission, and the North Pacific Landscape Conservation Cooperative. Uh, so the Nooksack Indian Tribe um, occurs right at the uh, foothills of the North Cascades, about 12 miles east of Bellingham, Washington. Um, attributes of our climate uh, change project include baseline monitoring for temperature in, in both seasonal and year-round temperatures, uh, discharge, turbidity, suspended sediment, and bed load, uh, water oxygen isotope monitoring. Whoops, I did something wrong here. There we go. Um, as well as glacier ablation monitoring, water quality monitoring, and salmon habitat restoration monitoring. Um, in terms of modeling, we've engaged uh, both the University of Washington and Western Washington University to do climate change temperature modeling, glacier ablation modeling, modeling of hydrologic change, sediment dynamics modeling, habitat restoration plan updating. update. So our project involves establishing baseline conditions, uh, evaluating projected climate change, um, assessing ecosystem impacts of climate change, looking at vulnerability assistant, uh, assessment primarily for um, Pacific salmon, uh, doing, a, uh, doing adaptation planning, again, for the customer, which is fish and fish habitat, which Treva talked about uh, yesterday. Um, we're doing this project in collaboration, um, and the Nooksack Indian Tribe is the lead entity for all this funding, and uh, federal and state agencies are involved, including EPA, BIA, the Fish and Wildlife Service, NOAA Fisheries, USGS, Washington Department of Ecology, universities including Western Washington University, University of Washington, Nichols College. In, also, we've engaged other tribes, including the Lummi Nation, Still Guamish Tribe, and the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission. Uh, we've engaged local stakeholders and NGOs, including the local watershed planning organization, the Wira One uh, um, Project, um, Evergreen Land Trust and the Wachtum Land Trust. And so our project is designed to holistically address not just climate change, but legacy impacts, treaty resources, ESA recovery, uh, Clean Water Act compliance, all together in one holistic project. Um, so the Nooksack River um, Basin includes a South Fork, as Steve just talked about, Middle Fork and North Fork. Uh, the dominant landscape um, feature in the watershed is Mount Baker with all the glaciers. Um, in terms of stream gauging, there's three USGS stream gauges in the basin. The Nooksack Indian Tribe operates six gauges. In terms of sediment and turbidity, uh, we have 16 suspended sediment um, stations, including turbidity. Um, we have three bridges that we sample suspended sediment and uh, bed load from, and we have one automatic ISCO sampler. In terms of stream temperature, we have about 66 seasonal and year-round temperature sites. In terms of general water quality, we have about 34 uh, water quality sites in the basin. And we also have a temperature lapse rate project going on with uh, Christina Bandaragoda. We have about 20 I buttons in place 
on an um, elevational gradient from about 200 feet up to about 7,000 feet. This information will be helpful in, in validating modeling for lapse rate. <clears throat> We also have an oxygen isotope um, monitoring program, which looks at the relative contribution of old water, i.e. from glacier melt, young water from snow melt and groundwater. <clears throat> and in terms of the glaciers in the Nooksack River Basin, there's about 148 glaciers and glacierettes, about 15.8 square miles of glaciers. The North Fork has about 12 square miles of glaciers. Middle Fork about 3.3, the South Fork about 0.42 square miles. Our field studies include snow and ice ablation measurements, stream flow measurements, stream and air temperature measurements, turbidity and suspended sediment, weather station including precipitation, solar input, relative humidity, and temperature, as well again as the oxygen isotope analysis. Um, our glacier field studies include two glaciers that are relatively um, safe to work on, still requires a backpack in carrying equipment into these uh, glaciers. One is the Shoals Glacier, the other one is the Hadley Glacier. Um, the Shoals Glacier has a weather station, stream gauge, uh, we collect suspended sediment samples, um, turbidity, temperature, oxygen isotopes. <clears throat> the Hadley Glacier um, is uniquely um, characterized by having a paired watershed opportunity. Um, one of the watersheds glacier fed, the other one is snow melt and rainfall uh, fed. <clears throat> stream gauges, suspended sediment sampling, turbidity, stream temperature, and again, oxygen isotopes. In terms of the Shoals Glacier, it, it was very well suited to have a very stable channel for uh, me measuring stream flow and developing a stage discharge relationship to look at flow relative to the time of the year, snow melt contribution, glacier melt contribution. <clears throat> um, this is a photo of our weather station at the base of the uh, glacier, Shoals Glacier, operated by a solar panel, um, stream gauge, measurement of velocities, um, we also put in a series of ablation stakes on the glacier just using a cordless drill and a wood auger on an extension. Um, we put in four ablation stakes, um, elevation ranging from 5,500 feet up to 6,200 feet. The Hadley Glacier um, had a similar set of instrumentations and again it provided a paired watershed opportunity. <clears throat> Some of our results Again, very preliminary. Uh, we have this huge data set of, of time series data, and it takes a huge amount of time and effort to analyze that data. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, some of our modeling has just been completed and, again, hot off the press, so to speak. Um, in terms of the shoals, glacier, flow, and temperature, it's, again, all of these results are intuitive, but at least we have a data set now to really demonstrate that intuition. Uh, this shows air temper, temperature relative to stream discharge, relative to stream temperature, and you can see um, glacier melt moderates stream temperature. Discharge it relates to temperature and precipitation events, as shown in this picture here. Um, in terms of turbidi uh, turbidity uh, from the Shoals Glacier, um, turbidity is lower during the snow melt period, uh, much higher during the glacier melt period. And again, this video, if I can get it to operate here, shows the relative contribution of <clears throat> um, uh, runoff or melt and runoff from the surface of the glacier relative to um, the margins of the glacier. And I'll show that here momentarily. <clears throat> this is what's happening on these pocket glaciers up in the North Cascades. And in terms of sediment, most of the sediment is actually not coming from the glacier itself. It's coming from the um, unconsolidated morainal material around the margins of the glacier exposed by um, the receding glacier. Oops, shoot. And this again kind of demonstrates where most of the sediment's coming from. Ignore the dog in the photo. Okay, um, in terms of ablation rates, 
Um, we had a range of ablation rates over the melt season of about 0.9 inches per day up to about um, 8.3 inches per day for an average over the whole melt season of about 2.5 inches per day. Um, looking at the ablation over time uh, related to um, air temperature, obviously it's correlated with air temperature as you'd expect. In terms of, of runoff, um, again runoff is related to the rate of ablation but also to um, rain, rainfall events on the glacier itself um, in terms of, of generating uh, uh, excess uh, runoff. Uh, in terms of the um, Hadley Glacier, again, it provided a, a paired watershed opportunity with the Hadley uh, watershed, which is primarily glacier melt served, and the Dobbs Creek drainage, which was primarily um, snow melt and rainfall served. <clears throat> we have uh, stream gauges at the bottom of each of these watersheds, and the gauges are within about 100 feet of each other. It's a perfect paired watershed um, opportunity. and um, Comparing the stream flows, uh, Dobbs Creek, again, snow and rainfall activated, it's much more variable than um, the Hadley Creek um, drainage, which is primarily glacial melt um, served. And correlating precipitation with the runoff from both glaciers, obviously the snow melt rainfall activated watershed is much more responsive to wow. rainfall events than the glacier served watershed. In terms of temperature, um, uh, Dobbs Creek had a higher overall temperature regime and higher peaks in temperature than Hadley Creek. In terms of turbidity, uh, turbidities from the Hadley Glacier was much higher than from the snow melt rainfall um, activated watershed. And in terms of glacier modeling, um, again, uh, there's a collaboration between University of Washington and Western Washington University. Chris Franz, who will be giving a talk later on, was fundamental to this collaboration. And uh, University of Washington provided um, assistance to Western Washington University in regard to training on climate forcing and downscaling and provided the source code for the glacier ablation module <coughs> for use with the uh, distributed um, hydrologic soil vegetation model that was used. Uh, Western Washington University calibrated and verified that model. They simulated river basin hydrology using several GCMs and RCPs. And uh, one of the early results, again, just came from Western um, on Monday, shows uh, glacier behavior starting in 1950, projecting forward to 2099, and it shows what we can look forward to um, in the future. And so here it is in two, 2099 compared to 1950. <clears throat> in terms of the hydrologic mo uh, modeling, um, it's obvious that uh, the river goes from a bimodal distribution of hydrology to a unimodal, going from a, a, a snow melt rainfall transition waterfall to a primarily uh, rainfall activated watershed. And you can see this through this sequence of slides. Uh, one of the more interesting outcomes of this modeling, it shows the change in the hydrograph from historical to 2075, and then overlaying the uh, projected hydrology in 2075 with 2015 data, it shows that the water year 2015 had a very similar hydrograph to what's projected for 2075. So this last water year provides a really good indication of what hydrology in the Nooksack River could be like in 2075. With that, thank you very much. Appreciate your time and interest. Yes. How much did the uh, did those two glaciers recede during this last summer? Because I heard that there were some pretty dramatic uh, recessions of some North Cascades glacier. Yes. Um, just to put it in context, since the Little Ice Age, which is a little bit different than what you're describing, um, um, some of the glaciers have undergone about 12,000 
uh, feet of recession. Uh, since about 1990, um, some of the glaciers have undergone about a thousand feet of recession. These little glaciers here, um, we started visiting these glaciers with Maury Pelto in 2011. We've, we've noticed about a hundred feet of recession on these two little pocket glaciers. Yes? Uh, the difference between a glacier and a glacierette is um, a glacier is a working body of ice. That is, it's flowing, it's carrying sediment, it's dynamic. Where a glacierette is really a, a vestigial glacier, it's a, it's, a, it's a body of ice that's really not doing any um, active work. And then the other question about distinguishing sources of sediment, um, again, we have this huge time series of data. We just started analyzing it right now. We really can't distinguish between uh, sediment um, generated by the exposed margins of the receding tongue as opposed to the sediment that's actually in the body of the ice. Yes? Yeah, the question is, um, do we plan to uh, model groundwater and, and sediment? And I'd say yes. Um, we contracted the USGS to put together a conceptual model for the South Fork Nooksack River to look at the relationship of groundwater and support of thermal refugia. The other question about sediment is, you notice that we are, we are uh, uh, initiating work on, on modeling sediment dynamics in terms of the increased frequency and magnitude of, of, of sediment being um, uh, transferred to the river and transported down the river and incidentally a lot of our work is going to become our output of our work is going to be, gonna be uh, become input to Eric Grossman's uh, work with the USGS. Is that correct Eric? <laughs> <laughs> Whether you like it or not. <laughs> Any other questions? Great, thank you very much.